welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Kevin Gallagher, a poet, editor, and political economist who lives in the Boston area with his wife Kelly, their two children, and Rex Roth, the family German Shepherd. Gallagher is the author of four chapbooks of poetry and a full-length collection called Loom, published earlier this year. Loom tells the true story of how mill owners in Lawrence and Lowell, Massachusetts helped fuel the Industrial Revolution in this country, which relied in part on slave labor from the South. One mill owner, Amos Lawrence, was so troubled by how slaves were treated that he decided to support the abolitionist movement, despite the ramifications for his own business. The poems in Loom recount his unexpected heroism and give voice to many of the men and women who were affected by slavery in the years just before the Civil War. Gallagher has read those poems in many prominent venues recently, including some of the mills in Lawrence, the city named after Amos Lawrence, and at historical societies. Gallagher's poetry has been published in many journals and newspapers, including the Harvard Review, Partisan Review, the Christian Science Monitor, and others. Gallagher edits Spoke, a Boston-based annual of poetry and poetics, and works as a professor of global development policy at Boston University's Party School for Global Studies. I am happy to have Kevin here today to talk about his timely book and how poetry enriches his life. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to be here. You are going to share a poem from Loom. Sure, I'd love to uh, read the first poem in the book, Pirating the Power Loom. Francis Cabot Lowell to Nathan Appleton, 1813. I stole their designs with my own two eyes. I smuggled them to Boston in my mind. Exporting designs meant jail in Britain. Workers of looms weren't allowed to leave. So I snuck into Manchester myself. I made it back two days before the war. I saw iron cards and spinning jennies. I watched Luddites spin and weave all alone while the looms marched in teams and didn't rest. I said to myself, this has to come home. My baggage was searched twice at Halifax. They didn't find drawings of their machines. I sketched it all out in my memory. I had their designs in my head with me. One of the things I love about that poem is that it's so unexpected. Not only do you hear about how looms came to Lowell, which I never knew the history, but there's theft involved, there's intrigue, and that alone would make me keep reading. What interested you in this story? The story gripped me from so many different dimensions. I was, uh, I'm a Bostonian to the core. Uh, and I've always loved the history of our region that we have here and its connection to world history. But I was living in Washington, D.C. Uh, for a year when I wrote the first draft of this book, and a couple things were happening. I was reading a lot of uh, poetry for the theater, and so had characters talking in my head. Um, but uh, I was also experiencing how the Civil War is thought about and taught in, in Virginia schools, and my son was going to school there, and uh, it was prompting conversations about what happened during the Civil War. And thirdly, the Freddie Gray incident happened in Baltimore, and there were riots in Baltimore, and people that I were working with were very close to that. And those three things were happening, and I was at Gettysburg with my family, and there was one sentence in one of the tour guide uh, notifications that said, and one of the turning points of the war was when the cotton textiles uh, merchants from Boston shifted their alliances and started financing the abolition. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? Um, I had already written a couple poems inspired by that period, but then learning that made me just want to dive in and learn about this story. I think I, I didn't realize it until the end, but I needed to find some heroic act for myself. And, uh, and when I did find one, and uh, a momentarily one in, in Amos A. Lawrence and, and what he did later on from 
creating the power loom that actually accentuated slavery in the United States so much to uh, acting against his material interests to finance uh, abolitionism and, and later uh, freeing slaves under the Civil War to me was a uh, was an amazing inspiration that needed to be found, amplified, and written about. His story is so intriguing and inspiring because, as you said, in order for him to make changes in his business, he really had to make some sacrifices financially. He had to find a whole new way of doing business at a time when there really weren't that many options. As you were writing about him and learning some of the history, what, what struck you about his actions and his heroicism? Well, what struck, to me, what struck me the most was that he acted against his material interest. Um, a lot of us do things that we think are right because we think they're morally right. And in fact, in his day, he was part of something called the Whig Party, and they were called the Cotton Whigs because they, they wore actual wigs, but they said these are laced by cotton that come from the South. And uh, there was a defection from the Whig Party from a group of folks called the Conscience Whigs. And I have a poem in the book by Wendell Phillips, a famous uh, Boston abolitionist and orator who was one of the first members of the Whig Party to defect based on his conscience. And that's great, you know? When things are bad or when, when things need to be spoken out about, uh, it's one big step for somebody to say, hey, I'm going to speak and act on my conscience. And uh, so the conscience Whigs are incredible for that, and I write about that in the book. But what makes Amos A. Lawrence a hero for me is that not only did he act on conscience, but his conscience was in contrary to his livelihood, and that he acted against his material uh, interests. And that, to me, is doubly heroic, and uh, uh, it's, it says a lot. And so I wanted to find out more about that. And the poems in the book are all adapted from or inspired by the speeches, correspondences, and, uh, and articles about these folks during that period. Mm. Was there a particular turning point for Amos Lawrence? Absolutely. He was um, egregious in the early parts of his career. He did everything he could to solidify and strengthen what uh, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner called the unholy alliance between the Lords of the Loom and the Lords of the Lash. And he, uh, when William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist from Boston and uh, editor of The Liberator, a famous magazine from Boston, when he was getting too famous, uh, many of the governors and slaveholders from the South uh, would write to Boston area folks saying, uh, this guy, William Lloyd Garrison and his Liberator are um, getting too much attention down here. As a matter of fact, the Nat Turner Slave Re Revolt, uh, the governor of Virginia said to the Massachusetts, the Boston mayor, that he laid it on Boston's doorstep because the Liberator was getting out into that area. Um, and Amos A. Lawrence financed dragging William Lloyd Garrison through the streets of Boston and having him beat up if it wasn't for the chief of police who jailed him to save him that night. He probably would have been killed indirectly or at least directly with Amos A. Lawrence's money. But it's when Anthony Burns is tried under the Fugitive Slave Act in Boston. The Fugitive Slave Act said, okay, you folks in the North don't want slaves. We in the South, we want slaves. You don't have to have them up there. We're going to have them down here. And the compromise will be if a slave escapes from the South and comes up North, that if we capture him and try him or her, that we will, you'll have to send him back into slavery. So Anthony Burns was an escaped slave from Alexandria, Virginia, where I was living at the time, where I was writing the first draft of this. He escaped to Boston, and uh, his slaveholder found him, and he was tried at the courthouse in Boston. And there was a massive revolt of abolitionists trying to bang into the courthouse. I have poems about all this in the book. Break into the courthouse. There were some killings to try to capture him and take him to Canada so he would be safe. 
uh, he ultimately lost the case and had to be sent back to Virginia. And the Virginians were so proud that they got him and so angry at we in the North that they had the Virginia Cavalry and they paraded him through the streets of Boston on the way to the wharf to be sent back to slavery. And there was such a public outcry that at that moment, that's when Amos A. Lawrence said, they crossed this line and that's when I became a stark mad abolitionist. And uh, he really did. He joined the other side. He financed black regimens in the Civil War. He financed people from Massachusetts to go out to Kansas and vote for it to be a free state, while at the same time the governor of Missouri sending people into Kansas to vote for it to be a slavery state. He actually even sends John Brown there to protect them physically because they were peaceful and, uh, and were being subject to weapons and violence from the Missourians. Um, and so he really, he really did have an about face. And, and that, from, from going from dragging William Lloyd Garrison through the streets of Boston to financing John Brown to protect abolitionists in, in Kansas uh, is a turnaround that, uh, that we haven't seen many of them in the history of our, of our nation. Mm. You have a poem about Anthony Burns. Did you read it? I do. I will read uh, a poem based on his account of, uh, of what happened when he when he was recaptured and sold back into slavery. Anthony Burns, Boston, May 24th, 1854. I didn't want to make myself known. I didn't tell who I was. I got employed. I came to work. I worked hard. I kept my own counsel. I strove for myself. I didn't say I was a slave. I was going home one night. I heard someone behind me. I felt a hand on my shoulder. I heard the cannons, I think from the common. I hear because the Nebraska bill just passed. Stop, stop. You're the fellow that broke into the silversmith shop. I said he was mistaken. I was lifted off my feet. I think by six or seven others. I could not resist. I could not speak. I waited in the courthouse. I waited for some time. I said I wanted to go home. I said I wanted my supper. I waited in the jail. How do you do, Mr. Burns, said the man who opened the door. I said, I am fine, my master. Did I ever whip you, Anthony? I said, no. Did I not, when you were sick, take my bed from my own house for you? I said, yes. Did you ever ask me for money when it was not given to you? I said, I do recollect that you gave me 12 and a half cents at the end of every year. I was taken down with bracelets on my wrists. No, not such as you wear, ladies of gold and silver. I was taken down with bracelets on my wrists, iron and steel manacles that wore into my bone. You really capture the voice there, the complex emotions of both Burns and the the man who thought that he had been good to Burns, but really hadn't. When you were figuring out how to write this poem, how did you decide what the voice should sound like? You know, um, a lot of the poems there are in verse, are, are sonnets and villanelles, but I felt like um, Anthony Burns had to be organic. I mean, uh, so this poem is very much a free verse, organic poem adapted a little bit from his speech about, or his, his sayings about, uh, and writings afterwards about, uh, about the incident. And so it has a few lines from that, and then I built something around that that uh, tried to be in, in his voice and uh, tried to be him and in a lot of ways this is uh, this whole book is a is an exercise in empathy me trying to literally put myself in the head and mouth of each of these characters um, taking a cue from one of their journal entries or something like that but then really trying to be in dialogue about all of this and uh, the poems from Anthony Burns are sort of free verse poems splintered from works that he wrote himself 
Many of the poems in the book are sonnets or villanelles, as you have said. Why those forms? What did they allow you to do as a poet? Well, to me, uh, a sonnet is a great little vessel or a machine that allows you to have lyricism, imagery, and some sort of a pivot and, and tell a little story in each one. And, and since each one of these characters uh, is sort of steps onto the stage for a moment to tell a quick story, or at least part of the story, that the sonnet just, uh, um, it just seemed like the right one. It just, uh, the four or five of them happened to be that, and then I decided to go with that. And then the villanelle, there's three or four villanelles in there, and they're almost like epiphanies, or they're just real pivot points in there. And I feel like that form really lends itself for that. They're, it's in part song, it's in part a refrain, and it repeats itself, and it just really allows the, the flow of the book to take a deep breath and to almost meditate on what's happened at that point in it. And, and uh, looking back, it's easy for me to say that. I'm not sure I had designed it all that way, but it, reflecting, I think that's, that's why different parts of the book have different, different forms in them. You said that writing the, the poems in this book was an exercise in empathy. Talk a little bit more about that, because I've known you for many years, and I know that you are very compassionate, and you have a tremendous amount of empathy for the people you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. But what was it like to have empathy for people who lived many, many years ago? Well, I, in part, was inspired by a lot of things that are going on right now. but. Um, but I felt like uh, trying to engage in the immediate contemporary situation was, uh, was something that I, I just I couldn't get inspired by. I couldn't be driven towards it. And when, I, when these forces converged and I started diving into, uh, diving into this, I thought that the most important way to, to exhibit clarity, vision, experience, and song was to try to try to be in that, be in those moments as much as I can. I'm not a historian; somebody can go read the history books and learn about this. But to make it art, to make it music, I wanted to give snapshots of the experiences that these different people had at real crystalline times during their lives. As you were writing the book. What surprised you most? What surprised me most was more that I couldn't, especially during the first draft, is that I couldn't stop. Like, I, um, there was a lot of things that I should have been doing at a lot of those times when I was writing the book, but I just couldn't stop writing it. And I just got taken over by it. And I've, I've never written a book length epic narrative before. Most of my poems have been uh, inspired lyric poems where you can, it comes to you or you go to it. And after a couple hours, you have something that you'll work on later when you, uh, have time to it, uh, but then you sort of walk and you wait to be inspired or for inspiration to come to you. But here it was just this rolling mission, which was uh, surprising. I didn't realize that I could be literally taken by art and poetry by, with such force. And uh, it had negative and positive effects for people around me. I was, all, this is all I could talk about was, uh, you know, 16 years in the 1800s was whenever I found some new surprising bit of news like uh, the fact that Lawrence, Kansas is named after Amos A. Lawrence from Massachusetts because it was one of the towns where Massachusetts abolitionists had gone to financed by him. Uh, those factoids were surprising too in addition to the sort of you know, tidal wave of inspiration that, uh, that would just happen every day. Mm -hmm. When you read the poems to various groups, especially if you are reading in a mill or at a historical society, what surprises you about the reaction you get from the people who listen to your words? Well, I had a terrific experience at the National Park Service at the Boot Cotton Mill up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, I get all sorts of different um, different reactions that are warm and really interesting. Some of them say, sort of like you did, that it's great to hear these people's voices, 
right? That's one thing that poetry can do, is to bring the voices and the conversation to us today. Um, other people were really excited to learn some of the history bits, but I learned a lot more than what I shared with them um, because those folks were all there and the Lowell Historical Society and the National Park Service have been studying these things forever. And so it was this great dialogue after the reading of uh, me learning things about the history and them, uh, them welcoming, sort of bringing song and voice to some of this. It was a terrific experience and not your traditional uh, group of poetry audience. It was some folks who were there for the poetry, some folks for the story, and it led to a, a great conversation. For the people who have studied and researched this material for years, what do you think it did for them to be able to hear the voices? Well, I think, uh, I think uh, those folks, one, um, f probably read it the first time with skepticism. Who is this poet, and uh, is he going to get his history wrong? And, I, and so far, knock on wood, it seems like I, you know, I, have, I didn't stray from, from the truth that much. What I did was bring out the poetry in the truth. And, uh, and so uh, part of their reaction is, good job, uh, you, you got that fact right. And then the other one is more, uh, is more, wow, this is what a poet can do to this. And that it sort of brings history alive and brings it voice and language and song and allows it to, um, to sing and be part of, part, of, uh, part of today's conversation on similar, similar issues. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I really admire about this book is that it is so engrossing. You just Thanks. turn page after page because you have to find out what happens next. And a lot of that is because of the way you've written the poems. You have such a good sense of narrative. And every poem contributes to the larger arc of the book. Yet many poets today don't write narrative poems, or they don't write book-length stories. What do you think people get from reading or hearing work like this that they might not from more traditional poetry, or more conventional poetry, I should say? Well, it depends how you define conventional poetry. If we look at the arc of poetry, there's probably 100, 100 narrative poems for every uh, book of short lyrics. I mean, the Iliad, the Odyssey, Virgil, you just, Lucretius, you know, you go down the list and uh, they're the you know, Hiawatha by Longfellow. There's just such a long history of the narrative poem and it, uh, it did go out of fashion somewhat in the 21st century because it's not modern and I think, um, that didn't, I, I didn't plan on writing a narrative book, but, um, but it was gripping for me and it just, it was the form that, that this particular work of art or inspiration had to come out as. And um, I've got nothing against lyric poetry. I write lots of lyric poetry myself. I just think that, uh, that poets unfortunately have given the narrative over to the novelists. And um, there's a very different way to do novels in narrative and poetry in narrative, and there's a distinct difference. Uh, this is uh, this probably wouldn't be as good of a novel if it's a good poem, um, because poetry allows you to um, almost interact with the theater in some way too, and allow these points in the story to be speeches and conversations among people. Mm -hmm. So something that I have heard several times in this conversation is the idea of a turning point in someone's life. And I know that in your own life, there was a point where you were trying to decide whether to pursue poetry full time or hmm, economics. Tell us a little bit about how you made that choice and why poetry has remained an important part of your life. Well. Uh, poetry's remained a, an important part of my life because I'm a poet. There's just nothing I can, you know, I've never wanted to stop it. Uh, as you said, there was a point where I just wanted that to be paying the rent and the mortgage and the kids' college and all that kind of stuff. But uh, 
but I, I made a calculation that that's probably not the way that I could do that in the 21st century. And hats off to folks like you who, uh, who can and, and do sort of make it uh, your full on life's work. Uh, I was torn because I also, um, I'm also very concerned about the economy and how the world economy is integrating itself and the extent to which we're globalizing the world economy in a way that um, allows people to live the lives that they want to live and in a way that doesn't destroy the environment. And I said to myself, um, I think it would be hard to have a life in poetry and every once in a while I'll write a book about the global economy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, um, but I thought maybe it wouldn't be as hard uh, because the poetry is going to come anyway to get some more schooling, pursue a career in thinking rigorously in an academic way about the global economy and, uh, and being a poet too. And, and it's, been a, it's been a great balance. You know, everyone says the joke is that the economist knows the uh, price of everything and the value of nothing, and that the poet knows the value of everything and the price of nothing. So it brings balance to my life. Well, you do tremendous work in Thanks. both arenas. Would you read one more poem from the book? Sure. I mean, since we just talked about turning points, I, I guess I'll, I'll read the poem um, by Amos A. Lawrence, um, taken from his journals, when he said to himself that I am going to become a stark mad abolitionist. This poem's called The Stark Mad Abolitionist. Amos A. Lawrence, May 25th, 1854. I put my hands in my face and I wept. I went to bed an old-fashioned conservative. I woke up a stark, mad abolitionist. Look what you've done. I can do nothing less. You've given me a new purpose to live. I put my hands in my face and I wept. Then I put myself into his footsteps. Burns is a hero, not a fugitive. I'm a stark, mad abolitionist. I will see to it that we free Kansas. Your betrayal is my strongest motive. I put my hands in my face and I wept, but woke up a new man after I slept. I will give everything I can give. I'm a stark mad abolitionist. Anthony Burns, I will never forget. Stephen A. Douglas, I will never forgive. I put my hands in my face and I wept, and now I'm a stark mad abolitionist. Thanks. Thank you for sharing those wonderful poems. Welcome.